Bat shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 25th of the seventh month on our Creator's calendar as we comprehend it, which happens to line up with October 5th, 2024 on the Gregorian calendar. And we're continuing with our chronological reading of the scriptures or inspired texts as we comprehend them. We just finished with the book of Genesis or Bereshit and the deathbed testament or um, Baraka, the blessings, if you will, of Yaakov to his 12 sons. And there's really a lot more we could have gone into with those. There's books written on them. I always encourage people to study that stuff, but we can only point out so much. And like the scriptures say, the manifold chokma or wisdom of Elohim cannot be even comprehended by a single man, yet alone expounded on in one session on, you know, one Sabbath. So there's a lot of things that we will point to, that we'll allude to, that we'll kind of show a little bit of and then move on. Not because it's insignificant, far be it from that, but because there's so much, there's so many different ways you can do that. You can get lost in it and never, never get anywhere. <laughs> so our point and the whole purpose of what we're doing is to have these words in our minds and heart so that when we go over the other things, they'll be familiar to you, right? And then you can have informed decisions about what is being said and about what is written. But back on track here, the testaments of the 12 patriarchs it happens to be the, the deathbed witnesses or testament, if you will, of the patriarchs of the tell tribes to their children and brothers before they die. They are mostly handed down to us in Greek and Latin. There's a lot of information about those versions, so I don't want to get into that. There were fragments found amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls of three of them, and almost a complete copy of the Testament of Louis or Levi in the Aramaic, which we'll, we'll cover the differences there. And you'll, you'll see a little bit here about what you'll start seeing from the Bible after we hop back into that in the book of Exodus too. It's not, it's just, the truth of what is the versions that we have right here is an abridged version at best of what was originally given and you'll see that when we compare it with the book or testament of louis from the dead sea scrolls <clears throat> and this is why i tell you you have to be patient with the book of enoch and things like that because we might not have a perfect copy and a word-for-word -word translation of everything that was originally given you cannot be dogmatic about that. If you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, you can see the fullness of what the luminaries are supposed to do in the calendar with the sun, 364 days for a year. It's all divided perfectly and everything's given. And for the moon, a 254-day yearly cycle with a three-year synchronous cycle that has the full moon on the first night of the year, every third year, starting with the beginning of creation. So um, on the fourth day there, but that's not for now either. Point is, what we have here is not always the full version of what was originally given. And knowing that, we cannot just be stickler, look at one point and throw it out saying, well, that's not accurate. What we should do is, as it is written, go over the entirety of the thing, look for multiple witnesses to confirm matters, and see if it fits the criteria of what Kepha said really comes from the foreteller of truth. And when we find that it is, we should believe it without question. So without further ado, we're going to start with the testament of Yahusuf, the 11th son of Jacob and Rachel, or Rachel. He was the eleventh son, but the first one to pass away, as we'll see. The copy of the testament of Yahusuf, when he was about to die, he called his sons and his brethren together and said to them, My brethren and my children, hearken to Yahusuf, the beloved of Yisrael. 
Give ear unto your father, or give ear, my sons, unto your father. I have seen in my life envy and death, yet I went not astray, but preserved in the truth of Yahuwah. These things, my brethren, or sorry, these, my brethren, hated me, but Yahuwah loved me. They, des they desired to slay me, but the El of my fathers guarded me. Now, I don't want to do this too much, but I do want to point something out. We've just read through the contentions that happened with the families there, where Yaakov, our patriarch, the founder of the 12 tribes, he married two sisters. There was contention in the, the whole acquiring of them. There was infighting between them. There was some bitterness there about the children. And in the birth of those children that were begotten in these means with giving the concubine or the uh, maidservant, if you will, instead of doing otherwise, you can see it playing out because it was Gad, it was Dan, and these are the ones that were generally in anger and, and hating and reviling and trying to do the evil there. You can find it playing out in the children for what the parents were doing, and then it echoes and echoes, and that's literally what world history has been about. This is, and these my brethren hated me, but Yahuwah loved me. They desired to slay me, but the El of my fathers guarded me. They let me down into a pit, but the Most High brought me up again. I was sold into slavery, and Yahuwah of all made me free. I was taken into captivity, and His strong hand succored me, or comforted me, right, provided for me. I was beset with hunger, and Yahuwah himself nourished me. I was alone, and Elohim comforted me. I was sick, and Yahuwah visited me. I was in prison, and my Elohim showed favor unto me. In bonds, and he released me. Slandered, and he pleaded my cause. Bitterly spoken against by the Mitzrayim, or Egyptians, and he delivered me. Envied by my fellow slaves, and he exalted me. And this chief captain of Pharaoh entrusted to me his house. And I struggled against a shameless woman, urging me to transgress with her. But the El of Yisrael, my father, delivered me from the burning flame. I was cast into prison, I was beaten. I was mocked, but Yahuwah granted me to find mercy in the sight of the keeper of the prison. For Yahuwah does not forsake him or them that fear him, neither in darkness nor in bonds nor in tribulations, nor in necessities. And I would encourage everyone to read Fox's Book of the Martyrs to see that is true. For Elohim is not put to shame as a man, nor as the son of man is he afraid, nor as one that is earth-born is he weak or affrighted. Now, right here, there's two different variations in manuscripts. You'll see this quite often as we're going. They might have as many as three. We're going to read one of them for continuity's sake. We might go back and correct ourselves otherwise, but not all of these can be correct. So this is just evidence of different variations for whatever reason. And if, as we go through it, you might see the reason. Sometimes you might not. It could be it was just a, a colloquialism or an easier way of saying something on occasion like right here. But um, I'll leave it to you says, but in all these things does he give protection, and in diverse ways does he comfort, though for a little space he departs to try the inclination of the soul, or the inner being, nefesh. He 
In ten temptations he showed me approved. And this is something that we'll see again, or we'll, we'll see the foregoing of this in the book of Yobelim when we get to it, because Abraham was tried ten times. Then it mentions Jacob's temptations, and Yahusuf right here tried ten times. This is also the ten persecutions of the believers by the Romans before um, uh, foreshadowed in Yahusuf's temptations there. But it is the uh, the trials in the wilderness for the children, right, that they failed at. But everyone is put under trial. And even Abraham was tried and found approved. So that's something to keep in mind. It's our patient endurance in these things that gives us favor. It says, in ten temptations he showed me approved, and in all of them I endured. For endurance is a mighty charm, a great favor, right? And patience gives many good things. How often did the Egyptian woman threaten me with death? How often did she give me over to punishment? and then call me back and threaten me. When I was unwilling to company with her, she said to me, You shall be master of me, or Baal, right, lord of me, and all that is in mine house. If you will give yourself unto me, and you shall be as our master. But I remembered the words of my father, and going into my chamber, I wept and prayed unto Yahuwah. And I fasted in those seven years, and I appeared to the Egyptians as one living delicately, for they that fast for Elohim's sake receive beauty of face. And if my master were away from home, I drank no wine, nor for three days did I take my food. But I gave it to the poor and sick. Now, that's exactly what we're enjoined to do. This is something that we've gone over in a few places, and we will get to it in the course of time. But what's established right here is also what's enjoined for believers within the New Covenant times, that you literally will abstain from eating and use what you would have eaten to give to the poor and needy. And you would do this when you wanted to have your prayers heard and you're making petitions. This is, And I sought Yahuwah early, and I wept for the Mitzrayite woman of Memphis, for very unceasingly did she trouble me. For also at night she came to me under the pretense of visiting me. And because she had no male child, she pretended to regard me as a son. And so I prayed to Yahuwah, and she bare a male child. And for a time she embraced me as a son, and I knew it not. But later she sought to draw me into fornication. And when I perceived it, I sorrowed unto death. And when she had gone out, I came to myself, and I lamented for her many days, because I recognized her guile and her deceit. And I declared unto her the words of the Most High, if haply she would turn from her evil lust. Right. Often, therefore, did she flatter me with words as a set-apart man, and guilefully in her talk praise my chastity before her husband while desiring to ensnare me when we were alone. For she lauded me openly as chaste, and in secret she said unto me, Fear not my husband, for he is persuaded concerning your chastity. For even should you, or should one tell him concerning us, he would not believe. Owing to all these things I lay upon the ground, and besought Elohim that Yahuwah would deliver me from her deceit. And when she prevailed nothing thereby, she came again to me under a plea of instruction, 
that she might learn the word of Elohim. And she said unto me, If you will that I should leave my idols lie with me, and I will persuade my husband to depart from his idols, and we will walk in the law of your master, or your Yahuwah. And I said unto her, Yahuwah wills not that those that fear him should be in uncleanness, nor does he take pleasure in them that commit adultery, but in those that approach him with a pure heart and undefiled lips. But she held her peace, longing to accomplish her evil desire. And I gave myself yet more to fasting and prayer, that Yahuwah might deliver me from her. And, and I want you to notice, he fasted and prayed continually for deliverance. And while he was immediately delivered from those wiles at the time, he was not delivered from her completely. All right? He might have his purposes for what he's doing, but he will accomplish the desire of them that ask him. Okay? And again, at another time she said unto me, If you will not commit adultery... I will kill my husband by poison and take you to be my husband. I therefore, when I heard this, rent my garments and said unto her, Woman, fear Elohim, and do not this evil deed, lest you be destroyed. For know indeed that I will declare this your device unto all men. Your, your device, right? Satan has many devices, and men have sought out many devices, as it mentions in Ecclesiastes, right? It says, She therefore, being afraid, besought that I would not declare this device. And she departed, soothing me with gifts and sending to me every delight of the sons of men. And afterwards, she sent me food mingled with enchantments. All right, now this is Yahusuf, okay? And the woman of Egypt is doing this to him that wants him to commit fornication with her. I don't want to go into the gory aspects of the carnal nature of that, but I want you to consider what this might mean in a spiritual form of a parable of things that would happen later with his children. And you can see that these same things are happening too, quite literally, but also in a larger scale, right? It says, And afterwards she sent me food mingled with enchantments, and when the eunuch who brought it came, I looked up and beheld a terrible man giving me with the dish a sword, and I perceived that her scheme was to beguile me, to bewitch me right? To deceive me. That word beguile is the same one that Hua was beguiled in the garden. And when he had gone out, I wept, nor did I taste that, nor any other of her food. So then after one day she came to me and observed the food and said unto me, Why is it that you have not eaten of the food? And I said unto her, it is because you have filled it with enchantments, or with deadly enchantments. And how said you, I come not near to idols, but to Yahuwah alone? Now therefore know that the El of my Father has revealed unto me, by his messenger, your wickedness. And I have kept it to convict you, if haply you may see and repent." But that you may learn that the wickedness of the unrighteous has no power over them that worship Elohim with chastity. Behold, I will take of it and eat before you. And having said so, I prayed thus, The El of my fathers and the messenger of Abraham be with me and ate. And if you remember, we were just talking about that, that messenger that is called by the Yah, the name of Yahuwah, is our Mashiach. And that was the one that appeared to Abraham. He also appears to, Yah, to Yaakob 
the one on the ladder with the messengers ascending and descending upon him. He's the man that he's seen, that he calls Elohim, that he wrestled with, the, the messenger that guarded him all his long life and returned him safely to the land. That same one, right? Prayed to him and ate. <clears throat> and when she saw this, she fell upon her face at my feet, weeping, and I raised her up and admonished her, and she promised to do this inequity no more. But her heart was still set upon evil, and she looked around how to ensnare me, and sighing deeply, she became downcast, though she was not sick. And when her husband saw her, he said unto her, Why is your countenance fallen? And she said unto him, I have a pain at my heart, and the groanings of my ruach oppress me. And so he comforted her who was not sick. Then accordingly, seizing an opportunity, she rushed unto me while her husband was yet without, and said unto me, I will hang myself or cast myself over a cliff, if you will not lie with me. And when I saw the Ruach or spirit of Belial was troubling her, I prayed unto Yahuwah and said unto her, Why, wretched woman, are you troubled and disturbed, blinded through sins? Remember that if you kill yourself, Astaho, or uh, <laughs> I don't know how that would have been pronounced originally, the concubine of your husband, your rival, will beat your children, and you will destroy your memorial from off the earth. And she said unto me, Behold then, you love me. Let this suffice me. Only strive for my life and my children, and I expect that I shall enjoy my desire also. But she knew not that because of my master I spake thus, and not because of her. This is a side note. The Old English, it was a little more fluid in the vowels that were used. Another indicative thing for the vowels with the Hebrew here, but that's aside from that. They had different verb tenses, and they had different vowels they'd use when they were speaking in certain ways. When I spake instead of I spoke, right? You would do that with like um, I get instead of I er, I got. They do that with gave, and um, I don't think give is a good example for that one. But they have different. They put the a there when you have that, and sometimes they'd have a t at the end. That is a, um, an echo or a phenomenon of the Hebrew still in the English. You see it more, or you see it a lot more prevalent in the Old English, but it, it faded away with time after, especially after we came to the Americas. It says, For if a man has fallen before the passion of a wicked desire and became or become enslaved by it, even as she... Whatever good thing he may hear with regard to that passion, he receives it with a view to his wicked desire. I'm not just saying they, they hear what they want to hear, not exactly what was being said, right? I declare therefore unto you, my children, that it was about the sixth hour when she departed from me. And I knelt before Yahuwah all the day and all the night, and about dawn I rose up weeping while, at the while and praying for a release from her. At last, then, she laid hold of my garments, forcibly dragging me to have connection with her. When, therefore, I saw that in her madness she was holding fast, this is by force right there, to my garment I fled away naked. This one says, I left it behind and fled away, but it was torn, right? And holding fast to the garment, she falsely accused me. And when her husband came, he cast me into prison in his house. 
and on the morrow he scourged me and sent me into Pharaoh's prison. And when I was in bonds, the Mitzriite woman was oppressed, oppressed with grief, and she came and heard how I gave thanks unto Yahuwah, and sang praises in the abode of darkness, and with glad voice rejoiced, esteeming my Elohim that I was delivered from the lustful desires of the Egyptian woman. And often has she sent unto me, saying, Consent to fulfill my desire, and I will release you from your bonds, and I will free you from the darkness. And not even in thought did I incline unto her. Not even in thought. For Elohim loves him who in the den of darkness combines fasting with chastity, rather than the man who in king's chambers combines luxury with license. And remember, license is the permission to do what is otherwise unlawful. That's the license to sin. And if a man lives in chastity and desires also glory or esteem, and the Most High knows that it is expedient for him, he bestows this also upon him, even as upon me. How often, though she were sick, did she come down to me at unlooked-for times, and listened to my voice as I prayed. And when I heard her groanings, I held my shalom. For when I was in her house, she was wont to bear her arms, her breasts, and legs, that I might lie with her. For she was very beautiful, splendidly adorned, in order to beguile me. And Yahuwah guarded me from her devices. You see, therefore, my children, how great things patience works, and prayer with fasting. So he's attributing not only his deliverance by being put into prison to as being delivered from her as the effect of his prayer and fasting, but also his being esteemed and placed at the second hand of Pharaoh because he was also desirous of esteem, if you will. It just mentions directly right there. It was because of his disposition that he was given the inclination of his heart. It says, so you too, if you follow after chastity and purity with patience and prayer with fasting and humility of heart, Yahuwah will dwell among you because he loves chastity. And wheresoever the Most High dwells, even though envy or slavery or slander befalls, Yahuwah who dwells in him for the sake of his chastity, not only delivers him from evil, but also exalts him even as me. For in every way the man is lifted up, whether in deed or in word or in thought. My brethren know how my father loved me, and yet I did not exalt myself in my mind. Although I was a child, I had the fear of Elohim in my heart. For I knew that all things would pass away. And I did not raise myself against them with evil intent, but I honored my brethren. And out of respect for them, even when I was being sold, I refrained from telling the Ishmaelim that I was the son of Jacob, a great and mighty man. And that doesn't make a whole lot of context for us because it's not directly mentioned in what is the Bible. But after the events of Shechem, where all the inhabitants were afraid of them, right? The fear of them were put on the inhabitants of the land. Louis mentions to him that it was by his hand that they, they were going to drive out the Canaanites. And some of the giants and others that were fighting and attacking them did so during those times. It was Yahuda that was principally fighting the battles the leader of them, if you will. But Yaakov got his extra portion with his bow, as it's mentioned in the scriptures. And that double portion was given to Yahusif and his children.
but that was why how he was known as a mighty man. <clears throat> this is, do you also, therefore, my children, have the fear of Elohim in all your works before your eyes and honor your brethren? For everyone who does the law of Yahuwah shall be loved by him. And when I came to Indicopite, that that's a, a city, right? Indocolpite, I don't know how to pronounce that correct. This is with the Ishmaelim. They asked me, saying, Are you a slave? And I said that I was a home-born slave, that I might not put my brethren to shame. And the eldest of them said unto me, You are not a slave, for even your appearance does make it manifest. But I said that I was their slave. Now, when we came into Egypt, they strove concerning me, which of them should buy me and take me. Therefore it seemed tov to all, or good to all, that I should remain in Mizraim, or Egypt, with the merchant of their trade, until they should return, bringing merchandise. And Yahuwah gave me favor in the eyes of the merchant, and he entrusted unto me his house, and Elohim baruch him, or blessed him, by my means, and increased him in gold and silver, and in household servants, and I was with him three months and five days. And about that time the Memphian woman, the wife of Pontifar, came down in a chariot with great pomp, because she had heard from her eunuchs concerning me. And she told her husband that, the merchant had become rich by means of a young Hebrew, and they say that he had assuredly been stolen out of the land of Canaan. Now therefore render justice unto him, and take away the youth to your house. So shall the El of the Hebrews barak you, for favor from Shamayim is upon him. And Pontifar was persuaded by her words and commanded the merchant to be brought and said unto him, What is this that I hear concerning you, that you steal persons out of the land of Canaan and sell them for slaves? But the merchant fell at his feet and besought him, saying, I beseech you, my, my lord or my master, I know not what you say. And Pontifar said unto him, Whence then is the Hebrew slave? And he said, The Ishmaeli entrusted him to me until they should return. But he believed him not, but commanded him to be stripped and beaten. Now, I, I want you to see right here, when we don't have the law, or when we don't have his law, like the common law ruling, you have the rule of the whim of tyrants, and whatever they want, which usually requires inquisition in discovery of things. You can see it in the writings of Josephus, or Yahusuf, in the Antiquities of the Yahudim, and more particularly, the War of the Yahudim in the life of Herod the Great, where he, after he took over an Edomite, would torture people, if you will, to get them to confess. They would try to get things through inquisition, a type of what would come, but it's never a way, it's never a practical way to get useful information. Sometimes it'll work, but most most of the time you get people to say whatever they think you want to hear to get the, the pain to stop, especially if they don't know what you want. Either way, he listened to his wife and had poor judgment, and instead of inquiring diligently, he tries to investigate through hurting him, inflicting pain. I call it inquisition, right? They're inquiring through torture. This is, and when he persisted in this statement, Pontifar said, let the youth be brought. And when I was brought in, I did obscenes. Obscience. I, I did worship. 
That's another way that's translated, right? He bowed down to Pontifar. For he was third in rank of the officers of Pharaoh. And he took me apart from him and said unto me, Are you a slave or free? And I said, A slave. And he said, Whose? And I said, The Ishmaelim. And he said, How did you become their slave? And I said, They bought me out of the land of Canaan. And he said unto me, Truly you lie. And straightway he commanded me to be stripped and beaten. Now the Memphian woman was looking through a window at me while I was being beaten, for her house was near. And she sent unto me, saying, Your judgment is unjust or unrighteous, for you do punish a free man who has been stolen, as though he were a transgressor. And when I made no change in my statement, though I was beaten, he ordered me to be imprisoned, until he said the owners of the boys should come. And the woman said unto her husband, Wherefore do you detain the captive and well-born lad in bonds, who ought rather to be set at liberty, and be waited upon? For she desired to see me out of a desire of sin, but I was ignorant concerning all these things. And he said to her, It is not the custom of the Egyptians, or Mitzrayim, to take away that which belongs to others before proof is given. This, therefore, he said concerning the merchant, but as for the lad, he must be imprisoned. Now, after four and twenty days came the Yishmaelim, for they had heard that Yaakov my father was mourning much concerning me. And they came and said unto me, How is it that you said that you were a slave? And behold, we have learned that you are the son of a mighty man in the land of Canaan, and your father still mourns for you in sackcloth and ashes. And remember, um, oh, we, we didn't read that yet. In the uh, book of Yobalim, we haven't covered that directly, but we have read the section here about the Day of Atonement on the first of, or on the ninth in the evening is when they blot uh, the blood-soaked garment, the robe of, of Yahusif, if you will, and asked his father, is this your son's? And he was all that night and then all that day, the tenth, right, was when he mourned for his son. But it mentions that he actually was mourning for an entire year. He wanted to die mourning his son. So at this time, after 24 days, he was still mourning in sackcloth and ashes, consistent with what was going on in those histories. That's what I was trying to point out. The events are still going along with each other, and they correspond. They're not contradictory. It says, When I heard this, my bowels were dissolved, and my heart melted, and I desired greatly, greatly to weep. But I restrained myself that I should not put my brethren to shame that he would not discover them to have sold him because kidnapping is a death sentence. And I said unto them, I know not, I am a slave. Then therefore they took counsel to sell me that I should not be found in their hands, for they feared my father, lest he should come and execute upon them a grievous vengeance. For they had heard that he was mighty with Elohim and with men. They heard that he was Yisrael. They strove with men and Elohim and overcame, right? Then said the merchant unto them, Release me from the judgment of Pontifar. And they came and requested me, saying, Say that you were bought by us with money, and he will set us free. Now the Memphian woman said to her husband, By the youth, for I hear, said she, that they are selling him. <clears throat> and she sent a eunuch to the Ishmaelim, and asked them to sell me. The chief captain therefore called the Ishmaelim and asked them to sell me, 
and since he did not agree to pay their price, he departed. But the eunuch, when he had made trial of them, made known to his mistress that they asked a large price for their slave. And she sent another eunuch, saying, Even though they demanded two minae, give them. Do not spare the gold, only buy the boy and bring him to me. It says, And the eunuch therefore went and gave them eighty pieces of gold, and told the Egyptian woman that a hundred pieces had been given. And though I knew... I held my peace, lest the eunuch should be put to shame. He didn't want any of this to be discovered so that um, it would be known who he is. He just let these things slide, and he did not convict anyone of wrongdoing at that point. All right? This is what he's saying. He endured all these things for the sake of his brothers. For love's sake, if you will. You see, therefore, my children... What great things I endured that I should not put my brethren to shame. Do you also, therefore, love one another? Now, that's a different way to put it, right? When you're loving somebody, we're not to go out of our way to lie, right? But during the times of the renewed covenant, if you will, it mentions very distinctly that people would sell themselves into slavery to free others for love's sake. Right, They would do things that we would consider well beyond what is required in the written law for love's sake. And you can see that that was being done right here as well as a type. It says, Do you also therefore love one another and with long suffering hide you one another's faults? Love covers a multitude of sins, right? For Elohim delights in the unity of brethren and in the purpose of a heart that takes pleasure in love. And when my brethren came into Egypt, they learnt that I had returned their money unto them and upbraided them not and comforted them. And after the death of Jacob, my father, I loved them more abundantly and all things whatsoever he commanded, I did very abundantly for them. And I suffered them not to be afflicted even in the smallest matter. So unlike how he was treated, he did not return that, but he treated them with the beneficence that he could in the position that he had. Right. And all that was in my hand I gave unto them. And their children were my children, and my children as their servants. And their life was in my life, sorry, and their life was my life, and all their suffering was my suffering, and all their sickness was my infirmity. My land was their land, and their counsel my counsel. And I exalted not myself among them in arrogance because of my worldly esteem but I was among them as one of the least. If you also therefore walk in the commandments of Yahuwah, my children, he will exalt you there and will bless you or barak you with tov things, leolam wa'ed, or unto ages and witnessed, right? That's how it's typically written in the Hebrew. Leolam Wa'ed, but they translate it as forever and ever. <clears throat> and if anyone seeks to do evil unto you, do well unto him, and pray for him, and you shall be redeemed of Yahuwah from all evil. That would have been something that you also get a second witness of in Job. This one would have predated that by just a little bit. A lot of people don't have their conceptions of when they were written quite right. Um, and I'm not saying that I'm better than anybody by any measure. We just had the benefit of being able to read these things for and study it for a long time. And I'm sharing everything freely that he's given. 
So whether I'm right or wrong, you know, he will correct that too. But Yobab, the fifth from Edom, who was king from Basra, as mentioned in scripture, the Septuagint says that was Yob. And he was a contemporary of Moshe and Aharon when they were alive and in the wilderness, right? It, same, same times. He would have had his writings before the Torah was given, maybe, but not before Yahusuf said this. However, you can see in Job's life, which Brother Chris is not here, but he, he's at a Sukkot with others that are fellowshipping right now. And keeping that, he gave me a call the other day and he was asking about um, Job and what his name means. So I told him the best way to look that up would be check out the Red Dictionary. And I asked if he had the PDF. Long story short, he didn't. We looked it up for him. And Yob, while I thought it was afflicted, it's literally to be hostile or to hate. Enmity, grudge, or malice. So Yob is the hated. He was the one that was they had he was the one that was had malice against him, right? Or there was enmity against him, is what he had felt like. And that's where that name comes from. However, he, after what he had gone through, prayed for his friends to have them forgiven. So it was the same picture right here. It says, For behold, you see that out of the humility and long suffering I took unto wife the daughter of the priest of Heliopolis, or the priest of On, and a hundred which is where the phoenix, if you will, would, would travel to every 500 years. Well, we'll get to those when they, they're mentioned. It's a, as a type of the resurrection. But the priest of Heliopolis was a priest of the temple there where the phoenix would appear every 500 years. And that was the daughter, Asnath, right, that Yahusuf married. This is, and I took unto my wife or unto wife, the daughter of the priest of Heliopolis. And a hundred talents of gold were given me with her, and Yahuwah made them to serve me. And he gave me also beauty as a flower beyond the beautiful ones of Yisrael. And he preserved me unto old age in strength and in beauty, because I was like in all things to Yaakov. And this witness, we will see what that means fully when we read the witness of what Yaakov was like in the book of Yobelim, where he is being told by his mother to swear an oath, and he gives a, a statement of fact about his, his being and what he was like. It says, Hear you, therefore, my brethren, or my children, and this one does not have that. It says, also the vision which I saw, there were twelve hearts, which are deer, feeding, <clears throat> and the nine were dispersed over all the earth, and likewise also the three. And this one says, now, yeah, the nine of them were dispersed, now the three were preserved, but on the following day they also were dispersed. So it's just different ways of wording the same thing. And I saw that the three hearts became three lambs, and they cried to Yahuwah, and he brought them forth into a flourishing and well-watered place. Yea, he brought them out of darkness into light. And there they cried unto Yahuwah until there gathered together to them the nine hearts, and they became as twelve sheep, and after a little time, they increased and became many flocks. And after these things, I saw, and behold, twelve bulls were suckling one cow, which produced a sea of milk. And there drank thereof the twelve flocks and innumerable herds. So the first is a vision, and you can see it's kind of tourniqueted. It does not have everything. It has the going away of the, 
the northern kingdom, the going away of the southern kingdom, and the return. Although it mentions three, it should really be two and a half if they wanted to be technical. But then it, it does not mention anything of what goes on in the intern between the coming of our Mishyak, their dispersal again, their regathering at a later date that was foretold in Revelation and other places and literally happened. And then our our later regathering with them, just as Dawid or the beloved David, if you will, a type of the beloved that will rule, ruled over Yahuda first for a while and then over all of Yisrael. So there's different patterns that are playing out too. But you can see here, this one is missing quite a bit. That's part of the looking for the not missing the order of things. And sometimes things are not mentioned. Sometimes things have been removed, though. And um, if it's not here, you do see it in other places. That's what we have to do by going line upon line and, and just here a little, there a little, learning these things, taking it in and thinking about it, seeing how they play out, right? <clears throat> but this is the next one. It says, and after these things, I saw and behold, 12 bulls were sucking one cow, which produced a sea of milk. And there drank thereof the 12 flocks and innumerable herds. And the horns of the fourth bull went up unto Shamayim or heaven and became as a wall for the flocks. And in the midst of the two horns, there grew another horn. And I saw a bull calf. All right, and I saw a bull calf rounded them with twelve times, and it became a help to the bulls holy. And then... Uh, We'll look at both of these in just a second. We'll look at the other one, but I'll read this one. It says, And I saw in the midst of the horns a virgin. Now, this could be talking about what happened in the intern there with the 12 bulls, but um, it doesn't make a lot of sense the way, the way it was written. However, it mentions a bull calf here. And they talk about how that could be the Armenian, if it's not spoken of about Judas of Maccabee, right which would also go along with what you read in the animal apocalypse which is also corrupted in this section of it when it gets to these times about the uh the maccabean period antiochus epiphans and the advent of our mashiach right but to continue here It says, And I saw in the midst of the horns a virgin wearing a many-colored garment, and from her went forth a lamb, and on his right was as it were a lion, and all the beasts and all the reptiles rushed against him, and the lamb overcame them and destroyed them. All right, and then it says right here, And I saw that from Yahuda was born a virgin wearing a linen garment, and from her was born a lamb without spot. And on his left hand there was as it were a lion. And all the beasts rushed against him. And the lamb overcame them and destroyed them and trod them underfoot. And the bulls rejoiced. Because of him and the cow and the hearts exalted together with them. And these things must come to pass in their season. And do you, my children, honor Louis or Levi and Yahuda, for from them shall arise the, the deliverance of Yisrael. And this is foretelling the advent of our Mashiach, coming from Louis and Yahuda, because they intermarried directly from the, the paternal line, the, the direct line of Yahuda, but intermarried with Levi. You can see that as far back. Um, Nahash's sister, I believe it was, married the sons of Aharon, 
or married Aharon and his children would have been of Yahuda from their mother. Other than that, you have the accounts in the Good News where Elizabeth or Elisheba, the daughter of Aharon, married to Zechariahu of the lines of the Kohanim there, she is cousin to Miriam, who's of Yahuda. They are related. So there's intermarriage there. But this is seen and foretold of here throughout the Testaments and in the book of Yobelim, possibly elsewhere. You can also see the uh, the type of this echo where Louis and Yahuda intermarry in the ancient history of Caledonia as well. But now we'll check this side out. It says, And because of him, the messengers and men rejoiced. That is just like what is in Deuteronomy 32 from the Septuagint and in the book of the Epistle of the Hebrews, where all the angels, all the messengers shall worship him, right? It says, And all the land. And these things shall come to pass. I'm sorry, the messengers rejoicing at his birth too, right? When they announced it. It says, And because of him the messengers and men rejoiced in all the land, and these things shall come to pass in their season in the last days. Remember, the last days of the creation week is the context, that, the only context I'm familiar with when he says they are the last days. Do you therefore, my children, observe the commandments of Yahuwah and honor Louis and Yahuda? For from them shall arise unto you the Lamb of Elohim, who takes away the sin of the world. A direct quote by Yahukanon. Now you know where it's from, right? And I'm willing as we go through these things, you, you'll see that most of these places where it looks like it's novel they were quoting somewhere that's either no longer considered scripture or we don't have a copy of it anymore period some of these things are no, translated in what we call the septuagint quite often as opposed to the masoretic text but some of the things we just don't have in any scriptures anymore and you'll see evidence of that as we go but right here direct quote the lamb of el who takes away the sins of the world one who delivers all the Gentiles and Yisrael. For his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, or a kingdom unto ages, which shall not pass away, but my kingdom among you shall come to an end as a watcher's hammock, which after the summer disappears. And that's true of the northern kingdom as an echo and of Yahusuf's reign in the land of Egypt there. For I know that after my death the Egyptians will afflict you, but Elohim will avenge you and will bring you into that which he promised to your fathers. But you shall carry up my bones with you, for when my bones are being taken up thither, Yahuwah shall be with you in light. We'll get to that again, but he in light, right? As the prince of light, Yahuwah shall be with you in light, and Belial, or Belier, shall be in darkness with the Egyptians. That's another theme that we'll see continued in the visions of Amram, if I remember correctly. Just one moment. This for I know that after my death, the Egyptians I already read that part, sorry. <clears throat> but it says, and carry you up as Nath, your mother, to the hippodrome, and near Rachel or Rachel, your mother bury her. And this one says, And carry up ye Zilpha, your mother, and, and nigh to Bilha by the hippodrome. Why he would mention these ones, I don't know, okay? But the same thing, bury her near to Rachel. And when he had said these things, he stretched out his feet and died at a tove or good old age. 
and all Israel mourned for him, and all Egypt with a great mourning. For he felt even though the Egypt, sorry, and when the children of Israel went out of Egypt, they took with them the bones of Yahusuf, and they buried him in Hebron with his fathers, and the years of his life were 110 years. All right. And that's all we have for this one. So next week, Ab willing, we will continue with the next one in order, which I believe is Shimon or Reuben. We'll, we'll double check. But until then, you have a wonderful Shabbat, a Shabbat Tov, um, a wonderful Sabbath, a great week or a good week ahead. And we will see you next time. Shalom.